Hey everybody, um, my name is Rachel and uh, this is John. And Hello, uh, welcome to our, our channel that we have actually renamed as uh, Lions, Tigers and Bears. The focus of this channel, at least uh, what John and I have discussed is that we are gonna be taking a turn towards focusing a bit more on the supernatural because this seems to be an area that um, isn't discussed as widely, like from a biblical perspective. And so what we're wanting to do is create content that is gonna help people who either, maybe they know um, nothing you know, about scripture as it relates to supernatural, but also those who maybe know a, a great deal and could provide um, feedback to us as well as, um, you know, maybe they can learn something new as well. So I will let uh, John kind of take over a little bit more of the introduction from here. Yeah, no. So um, it is a very rare and beautiful thing to be able to discuss issues like the supernatural, um, issues such as demons, angels, and unusual uh, things that are spooky, things that go on. And the reason why is usually uh, it gets discussed strictly as an academic exercise. Um, I remember, you know, reading, you know, articles where it was clearly meant to be kept up in an ivory tower. And we want to be uh, open to everyone who arrives on the channel. If you are an atheist, if you are a new ager, if you are a practicing pagan, um, if you come from a different worldview, you are welcome. We want your questions. We want you to view us. Uh, we want you to check us out. We want to hear uh, what you have to say when you have to share. Um, and the other, of course, a way in which this often gets discussed is strictly in the realm of uh, usually talks that exorcists give. Um, my qualification is, as, as I was joking with Rachel earlier, I have a master's degree in playing Nintendo. Uh, <laughs> I have a, uh, a bachelor's in the, the powerful art of tons and tons and tons of great coffee. And otherwise, I'm an ordinary Joe. Uh, I do have qualifications in other areas. By the end of the day, you know, Rach and I here are trying to just represent just disciples of Jesus Christ in a way that is, um, you know, not not cringily annoying and is accessible to you, the viewer. And man, are you in for a wild journey? Because lions, bears, tigers, uh, Nephilim, demons, the ghost of Harry Houdini, and uh, Doctor Strange Love, oh my. <laughs> That was definitely a great introduction, John. And as far as uh, my qualifications, I suppose you could say that I have every qualification that I need um, from God in the event that you do not believe in God. My hope is that by you know listening to our stories and, and listening um, to, to what we have to say that you know that the truth will be confirmed for you. And um, what I would argue collectively is our experience qualifying for um, specializing and discussing, I would argue demonology kind of as an umbrella term is that we do have personal experience with the supernatural, both in the, in the positive and, and the negative. And uh, when I say that, I don't mean to confuse it with positive and negative energy, but rather good versus evil and holy versus demonic. And that is a whole other ball game. So with that being said, uh, let's dive right in and really come to like the first question that we want to discuss. And I'm gonna give John the floor on this one to, dis to explain, but the first thing we're gonna discuss is because we are demonologists, uh, we're discussing what is demonology? What, what is the study of demonology? So uh, John, if you would like to yeah, enlighten us on that, feel yeah, free so, to, uh, to jump. Demonology has two compound parts, um, as, as the name suggests, demonology, uh, the study that pertains of demons. And I'm not trying to be flippant, although I absolutely totally am uh, in some ways. Uh, the question of what is or is not a demon could be a four and a half hour lecture series. Um, to reduce it down to its most easy and edible piece, of candy left over from Halloween from ages ago. Is it candy corn? I love candy corn. You know, candy corn, uh, we, we, we debate candy corn. I actually am really a Reese's Pieces guy. 
okay. you can feel free to know, to donate to www.pleasefeedmywasteline.com uh, right over here. <laughs> but um, you know, the thing about it is a demon is not necessarily what you might've heard from Hollywood. And a demon isn't necessarily what you might've heard from um, a class of religion and your undergrad, if you took comparative religion as a course. Uh, and a demon, even if you grew up in the church or institutional denominational churches might not necessarily be what you heard about there. And the confusion comes in um, as to first, how does the Bible define demon? Uh, we, we will let the Bible define that. And then also too, um, how has the experience of Christians and non-Christians alike over the course of thousands of years, um, you know, determined how we view these creatures, these, you know, creepy, spooky crawlies? Well, first, um, the word demon comes from the Greek daima, and the term uh, diaboli means to tear apart, to rip apart. And what we see early on in Greek literature um, is an awareness of, uh, you know, the gods with the lowercase g, who are reigning over certain areas on the planet Earth. And what's unique about these lower g gods um, is often they are demanding things like, you know, what every single culture was up to for, you know, about 4,000 years before the arrival of uh, that little thing called Christianity. And with, with the exception, of course, of uh, Israel, and even then they fell into it. Uh, human sacrifice, everyone. Everyone's favorite pastime in the ancient world. Um, my Irish ancestors did it. If you came from ancient Asia, believe me, you guys did it. Um, there, there's evidence of every form of human sacrifice everywhere you go. Uh, these little G gods uh, also seem to be obsessive about basically trying to get humanity uh, into engaging in petty squabbles. Have you read the Iliad or the Odyssey? Uh, these nasty uh, beings really wanted us to kill each other as much as possible uh, and seem to enjoy doing it, by the way, as well and instigating it. Uh, usually over things like sex, money, power, uh, not quite rock and roll, although technically Achilles deserves the title of one of your early rock and rollers of all time. <laughs> you know, I mean, basically, I mean, he gets in a whole beef and Homer over uh, a girl, but I can run on a slave girl. It's like, yo, you want to steal my slave girl? Well, you can fight your battle for you. So, you know, when everyone says, um, you know, God, the Bible is like all the other gods. So we all follow the same thing. Kumbaya, my lord, kumbaya. Uh, go, go, go read our literature. Just, 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 just go do it. I, I, I encourage you to, to see why that is not the case. So these, these beings seem to have geographical specificity across the ancient world. These beings tend to demand total allegiance. And these beings not only having geographical specificity and demanding blood sacrifice and all things ugly and bad, um, seem to have a particular clash in the Old Testament of the Bible with uh, a figure uh, revealed from page one of scripture, uh, revealed as Yahweh, the God of gods, to quote one of the Psalms. And what's unique about uh, this Yahweh in relationship to these other lowercase g gods is uh, Yahweh makes some claims that are, you know, uh, particularly unique. Unlike the lowercase g gods of the nations, uh, the big case g god created the world out of nothing. Uh, Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God, that is Elohim, uh, which is a plural word used as a singular. So, you know, it's talking about spooky stuff, which we'll get into, it's the Trinity, created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the spirit of God, uh, brooded upon the face of the waters and the Lord God said let there be light and there was light and the evening and the morning was the first day yip hip hooray guys you think oh I heard that in Sunday school how cute John well there's something unique about what's going on there uh, from a biblical point of view uh, one you notice God kind of created the heavens and the earth out of nothing try reading other worldviews okay where essentially the uh, the God of the Norse uh, who's not Wotan, by the way, he's, he's another god, uh, he kind of basically ends up being chopped up into pieces, being basically turned into the universe, made of pre-existent stuff. Uh, Try reading the Hindu Vedas. 
uh, where the lowercase g gods uh, basically come out of an endless cycle of repetition. Uh, my Celtic ancestors, same thing. And even the Duatha Danann are very interesting characters in that same tradition who are like, uh, basically like very skyrim -esque. It's really, really juicy. The God of the Bible is responsible for creating the universe out of nothing. And the lowercase g gods initially according to um, lowercase t tradition, um, basically are clearly made by the creator of the universe. And we would consider them essentially members of God's heavenly court. And their, their mission, their job initially, according to the Psalms um, and according to the book of Hebrews is ministers or servants of fire, which basically means in a nutshell, their job was basically to be uh, servants in God's uh, plan of, you know, administering the, the joy of the universe. Because God is a community. According to the Bible, he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one essence. He's fun, you know? You don't need a PhD to know that, you know, if God's the author of Skittles, he's a good God. If, God, if you don't like Skittles, if God is the author of M&Ms, he's a great God. If God's the author of basically the sunrise, he's a better painter than Michelangelo. Uh, and he totally kicks George Lucas's uh, more recent monstrosities into the abyss. So why am I mentioning this? Is because from the first verses of Genesis, um, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Already we've met hell, guys. Uh, at least hell is an interesting place because that term, the deep in Greek, is a buso, meaning the bottomless place, um, basically where darkness dwells. And we, we see the verse in God divided the light from the darkness. Uh, so is that the creation of the first day? Well, that's the mainstream interpretation. But the early church read that verse and they said, you know what that really means? Um, at some point, God at the beginning of time uh, must have given these beings a choice. Will they serve me or will they not serve me? And lowercase t tradition, and since it's not found in the Bible, um, it's just simply a, a matter of, I think, a good philosophical, you know, explanation it says that God revealed to those beings, we would call them angels, angelos, which doesn't really mean, um, it doesn't really mean, but guys that they have like literal wings and they flap around, although they, they, they do appear to have uh, some wings in Isaiah chapter six. What it means is it's a term meaning messenger, it refers to their job, their, their J-O-B. But philosophically, uh, the idea is that God revealed to them in advance that he would become a human being through the womb of a woman. And what this means, therefore, is uh, that these angels would have to serve humanity in the future, their younger sibling, as it were, and that it royally pissed them off. Now, whether that's true or not, what we do know from the Bible is that a ringleader among them named Lucifer, you might have heard of him, um, and no, he isn't like the show Lucifer in any way, shape, or form. Basically, uh, says in uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 that he won't serve. And from Revelation 13, a third of all those beings fall with him. And these are the guys who we mentioned, the lowercase g, gods of the nations, who basically are responsible for not just, you know, grandma becoming possessed or you know, the little witch next door, or, uh, you know, all the woes of society, hip hip hooray. Um, it's really these guys who are responsible for um, things like the genocide, the war, the famine in the Old Testament, and are still responsible for them today. Now, here's a really cool question for all y'all, and I'll, I'll throw this over to you, Rach. Um, in light of all this stuff, you might ask yourself, like, hey, well, that's, that's really great. But, uh, you know, why should I believe in my whole heart your narrative more than any other? And I, I think that we have, you know, good personal testimony. Um, but, you know, like, just as observers of the world, I think there are some signs that these demons or these terra parters, these diabolines, um, that they're real, that they're alive, that they're active, and that the Christian narrative or the biblical narrative is one which... Uh, gets a specific beating in the culture, which kind of might point to the fact that they might be behind a thing or two. Absolutely agree. And that, that was a great introduction.
Um, I do kind of want to touch on a few things, you know, you said, and um, one of the things I, I kind of want to talk about too, is I understand that a lot of people who may be coming to our channel don't necessarily have a biblical background. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons we are explaining these things, whether you believe them or agree with them or not, we are explaining what is the Christian um, narrative, what, what is the story of, of redemption woven uh, throughout the Bible, because that, that is the true uh, purpose of the Bible uh, being a, a collection, you know, of books to, so that we can understand this story. And I think before we go a little further in talking about what demons are and how they behave, I think it's important to explain why they exist. So from a Christian perspective, the reason that the demonic exists is because of the fall of mankind, as stated in uh, Genesis. Um, in, uh, I believe it is, uh, John, if you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the fall of man is in Genesis chapter three, correct? Yep, correct. Okay. Me too. And so to, to paraphrase, um, Satan comes in the form of a serpent and deceives both Adam and Eve into eating um, the fruit from the uh, tree that's uh, the knowledge of good and evil. Now, it's important distinction to make to say that this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because there is also an additional tree in the Garden of Eden known as the tree of life. And that is a separate tree. And I think people sometimes get those confused. Um, but when Eve takes and eats of the fruit of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then gives some to her husband, Adam, it is at this point that they suddenly become aware of the knowledge of good and evil. Before that, Adam and Eve were made perfect in God's image, and they did not know what evil was. To them, evil did not exist, and they did not experience it. They also did not experience sin. And so by disobeying God when he told them to not eat from that tree, that they could eat of any um, fruit of the garden except for this tree, that by disobeying him, that was the first sin. And because of the, of the first sin, now sin entered the entire world and then was going to plague mankind uh, until what is a, it will eventually be described in what I would argue, you know, is, is a very parallel book in Revelation, which would be the return of, of Jesus Christ. And then sin and death will be no more. Um, in the Christian narrative, whenever Jesus Christ uh, comes and, and whenever he died on the cross for our sins and was resurrected, it gave the opportunity for mankind to have a way to be redeemed. Um, this is uh, different, uh, of course, than the Old Testament laws and, and Jewish laws, and I, I would love to cover that another time. But for sake of uh, saving a little time on this recording, I'm just going to kind of discuss the New Testament version. So when someone accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior from the Christian perspective, this means that they repent of their sins, they acknowledge their sin nature, and they say, God, forgive me of my sins. I know that, you know, I am not good because the Bible says that, that no one is good. And all of us have inner desires to do evil. And if you search yourself, you know, will know that to be true. That is an undeniable fact that human beings are capable of incredible evil. If you don't believe that, then I'm led to believe you um, must live under a rock. So that being said, uh, when you acknowledge your sin nature and ask for forgiveness and ask Jesus to come into you and to be your Lord and savior, what this does is you're also acknowledging that Jesus uh, God, the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Trinity, and we'll discuss that later in another video. You are acknowledging God as being the only true God. So this is surrendering to him and it, and it is submitting to him. Okay. So the reason that it's important to discuss this and explain what sin is, because that explains why do the demonic exist? Why does death exist? Why do human spirits exist? and so on. So with that in mind, Winston entered the world and technically entered 
the heavens, enter, you could argue entered the universe um, with the fall of, of Satan. Um, he said in his heart that he could be higher than God uh, after God had made him basically the most splendid creature, almost I, I would argue in the entire universe, made him the most talented, the most beautiful, the most musical um and was precious uh, in god's sight he put him over all i believe he put him over all the angels correct john yep is that, is that correct yeah. okay and so when lucifer says i will make myself like god i will make myself higher than him this of course is the sin of pride it is the, it is the original sin and uh, some scholars and different people will argue, and I would make the argument myself, that all other sin does originate from pride ultimately. Uh, would you agree with that assessment, John? That yeah, all sin does kind of initiate from that original one. So um, that being said, because we know this is why the demonic exists and what is the demonic's purpose? So their purpose is basically to try to keep you from redemption. I mean, that's really their greatest purpose because they don't want you um, to follow Christ. They want you to follow Lucifer. They want you to follow the devil. They want you to follow them so that they can take away your soul from God. And their motivation from doing this is to harm you. They, they want to hurt you. They want to mean um, evil things towards you. So do not make, you know, don't make the mistake in, in thinking um, that the demonic can be controlled. Don't make the mistake in thinking that um, anything that is revealed to you or anything positive that may happen in the beginning will have a positive ending because it won't. And the reason their biggest motivation, you could say, well, why, you know, what is the motivation for Satan? to claim the souls of human beings and take them away from God, uh, whether that is by leading them into temptation, leading them into a life of sin and evil, or it is by maybe um, oppression or physical possession. What is the motivation? And for that, you have to understand, you know, even just maybe the most common Bible verse of all time, we can use John 3.16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. The motivation for Satan to steal your soul from God is so that you will not ever be able to enter into eternal rest with God. You will never be able to escape sin and death. And most importantly, Think of those words, for God so loved the world, meaning God so loved you, God so loved human beings on earth, that he was willing to sacrifice himself from you. And if you're a parent, then you know the most horrific thing you could ever imagine uh, would be someone to steal your child away from you or to harm your child, um, to want to um, do something bad to your child. So I think if you look at it from that perspective, it is easy to see why you know what what the motivations are of the demonic um so i'm going to toss this to you john and kind of describing like um and we'll if you would like we can kind of play a little bit of volleyball here and discuss what are some of the differences to know if you're how do you know if you're dealing with something that is is demonic versus a human or holy you know how do we differentiate this uh the bible says to the, especially for us Christians, to, to test the spirits. So, um, John, if you would like, you could give a few examples of how we yeah, can so do there, this. There, there are two biblical examples. Uh, first is from uh, the epistles of John, first, second, third John, where he says in a passage to test the spirits, and he defines um, a spirit of antichrist. Now, what, what is meant by there is not the antichrist with a capital T, but a, a kind of attitude or a kind of approach, um, which obviously we will we'll ultimately see at the end of time in, in life of a re very real person who is very much going to come, but an attitude that already exists right here and is a sign of Satan's presence. And he says, anyone who denies the father and the son um, obviously is, is not working within the operations of God. So what he means by that essentially is, you know, to know who Jesus is, 
is to encounter uh, the Father. He who sees me sees the Father, as Jesus points out in, in John 14. So wherever you see any denial of Jesus, mockery of Jesus, um, any kind of blasphemy committed against the name and authority and divinity of Jesus, particularly his divinity and his full humanity, uh, you're dealing there with not really human mockery at some point. You may very well be dealing with demonic mockery. And it's interesting that in this age, that level of mockery has increased. Um, some of it might be through trauma or woundedness on the human angle, but we see a rise. Uh, the other interesting detail biblically is Jesus uh, makes a clear statement that by your fruits, you shall know them. And the fruits of the spirit, uh, Rach may help me out with listing them all out, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But, um, you know, clearly there, there are elements of self-control. There are elements of peace, there's elements of unity, there is defense of the authority of the Bible. But for me, the greatest sign of the presence of evil in the life of the believer um, is Genesis chapter 3, when the Nakash, the serpent, the shining one, who we understand as Christians to be Satan, the accuser, the Hashatan of the rest of the Bible, um, he begins to sow doubt in the mind of Eve regarding the good identity of God and the authority of the Bible. And in the King James Version, he says, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So there is a question as to whether God means what he says and says what he means, whether his word is authoritative and inerrant. And inerrant means without error. And it's an extraordinary uh, belief, but it's one where we can plug our, our faith and our hope. Because the reason why is well, as soon as uh, there's a kind of doubt raised as to whether God means what he says in his word, um, that allows the devil, after Eve has stopped to listen, to, and Eve, by the way, represents here, of course, the historical figure Eve, but we all fall into this, every single individual, right? So this isn't us picking on a single historical figure, although she did very much in undergo that test and, and fall and Adam did indeed fall, but something we all, we all individually encounter, we all wrestled with, and hence why we now have that sin nature. What's unique is this idea that Satan instantly follows up the question with a bold-faced lie, right? And the lie is a very popular one, particularly if you study, you know, other religious movements or ideas. Uh, Satan says, uh, ye shall not surely die, for ye know that in the day that ye eateth thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. Ye shall be as gods. You know, there are current uh, movements in Christianity that would basically make the claim that by uh, naming certain things that you desire and repeating them out loud long enough with authority that you could bend uh, the divine to your will. There are certain movements of belief, if you carry out certain ritual practices, that you could become uh, like God. And yet we know that the Bible not only clearly warns against how dangerous, how toxic that is, um, and how subtle that is at times, but you see the, the pride you were talking about, uh, Rach, the pride that was responsible for the fall of Lucifer. Now there's an attempt for that pride to be adopted by Eve and by Adam and by everyone else. Uh, from a practical angle, how do you know that there is a demonic action in your life? Not just merely a psychological one or a personal one. Uh, it's interesting from a strictly secular angle for a moment that there are tons of cases and they are rapidly increasing if you listen to people like father chad ripperger in the catholic world or Derek prince formerly in the protestant world before his passing uh, of individuals who show up um, with what appears to be the ability to um to be suffering horrific things for which there is no psychological explanation and it doesn't necessarily need to be full on possession. We can discuss what that is like later, but this could just be basically phenomena that are not bound by the laws of nature. Now, um, Ellen and uh, Ed L Lorraine Warren, you know, they both focused in their own uh, public ministry on defining the fact that what demons do is traditionally called the preternatural, 
because often what they do is, um, you know, they, they're spitting in the face of God and they're sitting on his lap to do what they do. Whereas what God often does is the supernatural, meaning God is in total authority and in total control. So we don't want to give them too much credit. But, um, you know, the enemy clearly has the ability to do extraordinary things. And if you, for example, have encountered individuals who suddenly have the ability to, um, you know, know multiple languages, uh, be able to, for example, levitate, etc., just because there's a sign or a miraculous or seemingly miraculous event doesn't necessarily mean it's of God. The question is, is the fruit of defending the authority and inerrancy of the Bible there? Is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, one divine essence, is, is God's nature and God's love presented? If anything's pushing legalism, you know it's not of, of God. If anything's pushing a kind of pride, you also know that's not of God. If anything's pushing um, a kind of uh, wrath that alienates you and has, has you fixated on an idol, meaning putting um, a good thing in your life, whether it's money, food, sex, knowledge, power, as a kind of substitute in your life or distraction away from a loving God and loving your family and your neighbor as yourself, then you know that is not that those tendencies, those drawing aways are not of God. Would you add anything to that, Rachel, or do you, you complicated any of it? Um, yes. One of the things I was thinking about while you were discussing that and, and talking about how do you know something, you know, like if it isn't from God and how do you know if it's demonic, I, I would argue that some of the most important evidence uh, for this, both psychologically and physically, is to understand that if you are a Christian who believes in um, the entire Bible as being inerrant, then you believe that you are made in the image of God because this is what states in Genesis. And so it, not only your body, but your soul and your mind are made in the image of God. This is not to say that you are gods, so to speak, but just simply to state you are made in the image of God. And if you think about what Lucifer's desire was to make himself like God, and he clearly was not able to accomplish this goal and is going to be um, sentenced to eternal damnation in the lake of fire, then he wants to do everything he can to destroy the image of God in the meantime. This means anything that is of innocence, anything about you that, that, that can be good. Um, and I mean, uh, that's why I would argue that the, the demons do their best to both um, infest, oppress, possess, because what they want is to destroy the image of God. That, that's one of their desires, as well as to, you know, steal you away from your, your father who loves you. But again, like I said, destroying the image of God is, is one of their big motivators, which is why um, religious provocation is a very real phenomenon. They hate anything that represents the image of God, image of Christ, anything that, that is holy or good, they despise. And whether you're a Christian or not, as long as you are living on this earth, you have the potential to accept Christ and to become um, a part of the body of Christ and to be made righteous. And by that righteousness, you are now holy, made holy, and you are now a threat. That is another uh, one of the demonic's motivations to destroy you. So that, that's something I would say. And I would kind of like to start reflecting on what is some of the behavior uh, that we have personally witnessed uh, in regards to demonic activity. And maybe we can just both share something that would be a short story, John. And then um, yeah. we'll see where we can go from there. We may have to uh, close after that. So. Yeah, how many, how many you share a story, Rich? Uh, I, I think that you'd offer something pithy and beautiful. Oh, you want me to go first? Yeah, that yeah, was, yeah. That was, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, no, no, no. I didn't want to just the, talk the, the too much. people okay. will find that Rach and I are huge personalities. So if, if, uh, if we don't uh, bow to each other's screen time, we will end up speaking for ages. So I, I yield the floor. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah john and i uh we love to joke a lot and even though like we, we're being quite serious on this subject 
we actually do have a pretty good sense of humor and and just love to um, share stories and we're hoping to get to know you as well and be able to hear some of your stories that's one of the purposes of creating this channel so i want to make that clear is that we want to be able to share our stories but more importantly we want to hear your stories and we want to be able to offer some type of help assistance uh, whatever it is that, that we can help you with because we know that one of the biggest issues surrounding the demonic is that, um, and one of the signs uh, as well, that this could be something you're dealing with, is they will make you feel incredibly isolated and alone. And like nobody else on the earth understands what you're going through. Nobody else on the earth has ever experienced it and that there is no escape from it. So the, that's something to keep in mind. So if you are feeling that way and you have been experiencing things that are certainly out of the ordinary, and potentially have the, um, I would say the nature, you know, of evil about it to just keep that in mind, uh, that that actually is a normal response to something that is incredibly abnormal in this world. It's, evil is not meant to exist. Uh, I think not to, to get too philosophical here and derail the conversation, but uh, people always ask, why does God allow the evil and, and so on? And I think that's a video for another time. But what my question I pose is, explain to me why does evil exist? Why does it exist? And how do you know that it is, it is evil? How is it that all of us, with the exception of those who have essentially given in to the uh, you know, Prince of Darkness, recognize evil for, for what it is? And you know, we understand that you know, helping and protecting the helpless and the, and the innocent is a priority. Why do we have that desire? Uh, I know that secularists could argue that it's biological, but I argue that it is, it is spiritual because um, there are plenty of animals. If you watch any kind of animal documentary, you will find that although animals can certainly mourn the loss of their young or a mate or something like that, generally speaking, um, many, many times if a baby does die or, or is preyed upon because it is weak or an animal is preyed upon because it is old or because it is sick, uh, the rest of the herd just kind of moves on and nobody, they don't have a funeral. I mean, we could argue for elephants perhaps, but even still, you know, are, are they capable of having human understanding of what death is? I don't think that they do. I think animals have an understanding of death, but they don't have an understanding of eternity. And that is a, a solemn, I would say, difference between uh, human beings and animals. So I say that to kind of segue into talking about what are some signs that you're, you're dealing with something that could be demonic. So uh, I will take a, a story from, from personal um, experience. And it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster. So at one time, uh, I worked at a very, very old jail. I was a, a deputy sheriff. And um, in this very old jail, the, it, uh, some of the oldest parts of the jail were built in 1824. And they were actually in areas where they did have gallows. Um, and, and there is a lot of violent crime in this particular city. Um, and I worked there and started to experience some very strange things. Sometimes you would feel like things were following you. Other times you would just feel like you're being watched and you're already in an environment that is quite volatile and, and dangerous. So you're, I think your senses are already probably heightened. So that has a little bit to do with this too. Um, but one particular experience I had was sometimes I would sit in this area that was known as master control. And this happened to be over the site where they did do the executions originally. And I found that out because I kept having weird stuff happen and I started researching it and going, something weird is happening here. But perhaps one of the strangest things that I had happened, and this is just to show you, yes, there are human spirits, yes, there are demonic spirits, but sometimes the demonic can have human appearances generate um, to frighten you. And that's what I think was happening in this particular instance. So I was sitting alone in this match control area where in which you must press different buttons to open certain doors. There's no other way in and out. I have to be the one to open it. That's why it's called master control. No one gets in the jail. No one goes out of the jail unless I push the button. 
Um, there also happens to be like a, a chapel and then there was a hallway that was straight ahead uh, through, the, through the glass. And one night, and this actually happened on the same night. So I just wanna be clear on that. This happened on the same night. So one night I was sitting and uh, watching for people. It can be kind of a boring thing. When through the other side of the bars down the hallway, there was a man standing down there and he appeared to be by himself. He was, it looked like an inmate. And I'm like, oh, did someone, you know, let him out? Like I, I didn't see any officers around. So it was kind of odd, but he was staring at me through the bars and he was staring at me so intently as if, if I could just get through here, I would kill you. Like that was the look. And I was very, I was kind of intimidated. I, I just turned my eyes away. Like I was absolutely afraid to make, to make eye contact with this person. And, you know, I ended up seeing uh, him standing there, standing there, no guard ever came. And finally I kind of looked up and he wasn't there anymore. And I'm like, well, that's kind of odd. I'm like, maybe an officer came and got him, go to medical or something like this. Later that night uh, in the chapel, which was kind of at, at a bit of an angle across from where I, I was sitting in master control. Uh, again, I have to push the buttons to let people in and out of the chapel as well. And I looked up and there was an old man uh, appeared to be an inmate that was cleaning the chapel. And I'm like, that's kind of odd. And I'm like, I didn't let anybody in there. I'm like, maybe there's a back door that I don't know about. And also I, I would like to note that the light was on the chapel and it was previously not on. So otherwise I might not have been able to see the man in there uh, appearing to clean or do something. And so I, there was a, a um, like kind of a plexiglass thing that was on the side of this room in which the lieutenants and different people were staying in. And I knocked on the glass window to get the lieutenant. I'm like, um, guys, there's somebody, there's an inmate in there cleaning the chapel. Does somebody let him in there through a back door? And they go, no, you're the only one that can let people in and out. Um, did you let somebody in there that you're not supposed to? All of a sudden, you know, it was getting turned against me. And I'm going, I, I, I didn't let anybody in there, didn't let anybody in there. So I go over, you know, like I, I sit back down, I look over, lights off, nobody's in there. And I go, okay, well, that's odd. I'm like, maybe um, maybe an officer took the person in and out and, and I just didn't, you know, I didn't see it or they used some other door, but then I, I kept being told like, there is no other door. I'm like, okay. So I sat back down and that's when things actually became a bit more frightening was I sat back down and this happened to me on many occasions. It would always happen around three or four o'clock in the morning. Uh, so that's something to notice, uh, to note to uh, 3 a.m. is definitely an hour in which the demonic really like to operate because it is stands in opposition to the time that Christ uh, traditionally uh, was, was crucified, which was around 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And there was a old radio there was a kind of up in the corner that it's meant to be like a PA system so that you can talk to somebody on the other side of the glass. And the room became extraordinarily cold. I'm talking like it, it, it went down, felt like it went down to like 30 degrees in there, like freezing cold. And I kind of tapped on the glass. I was like, guys, can y'all like um, turn the thermostat up, you know, a little bit or something. And they're like, Oh, it's set on 74. I'm like, okay. Um, I put on my coat and I sat back down and then I started getting this eerie feeling uh, of dread and um, just an incredible overwhelming sense that something evil was watching me. And about that time, a fog appears to start filling the room, not a heavy fog, but like noticeable enough that, that it just seems like there's something in the air. And then uh, on the PA system, something pushes the button from the other side and sounds like it's breathing into the mic. That really terrified me. And immediately I just said, you know, in the name of Jesus, like God help me, you know, get whatever this is away from me now. And um, I mean, nearly instantly that the room became warmer, uh, the sound stopped, the fog lifted. And so all of that was strange enough, 
But then it got just a little bit weirder than that because I had a coworker of mine who um, happened to be a practicing witch. And um, we were talking one night, not long after that. And I said, I have a weird question. Cause she was, she was, I mean, I understand we were of different religions, but she was always very kind to me, you know? So total respect for her as a person, even if we disagree about beliefs. And I said, does anything strange ever happen to you here at work? Um, and I was like, I feel like I know this is going to sound insane, but I, I think the jail is haunted. And she kind of laughed at me because she'd been working there for like 10 years. And she goes, oh, did you see the guy who stares at you in the hallway for master control? Or what about the guy cleaning the chapel? Now, I did not tell her that that is what I saw. Um, and I do have kind of questions as to how exactly she had that knowledge. I don't know if it's because she saw it herself um, or potentially was tapping, you know, into something else that I'm not aware of, um, not necessarily something good. We'll just put it that way. I think right. she possibly could have been tapping into something that although she had good intentions, maybe did not have good intentions for her because she did tell me a few different times that she would actively see spirits and things uh, just kind of around her house. And I assure you, that is not some kind of gift of sight that's just normal, that that's um, clearly things feel like they can take up residence um, there that, that, that shouldn't be. Um, so that's something to consider as well. And I, and I say all this not to disparage you know, the person that I know and I care about. Um, but just to kind of explain from my perspective what I was thinking at the time. And that, amongst many other things, began um, some of my journey down this path to, to being a demonologist and really understanding this stuff, understanding how to spiritually combat it and how to defeat these um, demons. I was going to use a bad word, but it's a Christian channel. So <laughs> not going to. Uh, but yeah, defeat these evil things. Um, so that's one of my stories there, and it's not the earliest experience I have with the supernatural, but it was one of the strongest confirmations that uh, I was experiencing something that was incredibly abnormal, and, and that other people had experienced it too. So I will pass the baton to you, John, to share a story, and uh, then we'll probably close out and start prepping for the next episode. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, as, as one can easily tell, um, you know, I am uh, a dude who reads way too much and that often is good and that often is bad. And one area is where it makes it good is often again to long-winded glorious conversations with friends. And sometimes those were well into the evening. And I had this habit of going to a local tavern um, having a, I assure all, moderate number of pints and basically hiking with one of my childhood friends on a local um, wooded path that intersects uh, several different parts of Westchester County, New York. And sure enough, um, this path uh, is very historic. It has been um, the residence of Washington Irving, the author of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Um, it has been actually decided, yes, an actual literal Native American burial ground, of all things, uh, was the camp of Native Americans at one point. Um, it was the, you know, the launching ground for uh, Washington to march from the New York area down to Yorktown, where he won the American Revolution. Um, and it is an area uh, which is clearly spiritually charged. Um, I've had conversations with local members of clergy across the denomination that they've seen an odd thing or two. So it is a, it is a trail and it's an area that has a lot of history to it and it has a lot of markers. Well, you know, on one particular evening, uh, this was early on, there were many, many such occasions, but this was the, um, the one that was the most dramatic um, encounter. I was walking with my good friend, Matthew Lewis, um, and we were beginning our hike uh, around, I'd say, 11.30 in the evening. Um, and, you know, we're discussing philosophy, theology, history. We're not really getting involved into anything spooky. So we, were not, we weren't actively going to ghost hunt. We weren't going out to demon hunt. 
We weren't looking for things to go bump in the night. I have walked those trails dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times and nothing had happened previous to this. So it wasn't as though we were looking to find something and we weren't psychologically primed to do it either. Uh, we also didn't excessively, you know, enjoy the pub that evening either. We basically were, you know, soberly talking, hanging out, laughing. And we cross over um, what is like a small brook or stream or waterway that is in the middle of this trail through these lovely residential neighborhoods after dark. And, you know, some of the houses are quite nice. You know, this is not, I wanna emphasize, this is not the middle of the woods, the middle of nowhere, okay? This is in the middle of suburban New York. Um, it's wooded to a degree. There's trees, but you know, someone from the Appalachians would look at me and laugh and say, well, you, you, know, you Yankee, you up there, you know, you're surrounded by just ordinary trees. Well, we crossed this stream though. And, you know, pre, you know previously, um, I might have thought that the place felt seriously charged. But this time, um, I, I had the overwhelming sense that we were being watched and being looked at. This would be about uh, now between probably 12 and 1, 1 a.m. in the morning. And, you know, I, I initially chalked it up uh, to, you know, essentially the jitters and it being dark and it being, you know, a fairly semi more wooded area. And before I open my mouth, my, my buddy Matt also says the exact same thing out loud, which is pretty great. He says, oh, John, um, I believe from the bottom of my heart that we're being looked at and I don't like it and it's not good. So we, we got a little further and um, I have this temptation in my heart to bolt and to run. And while the temperature, it was, it was fairly warm. It was, I believe, early spring, you know, but it, it felt like the temperature once again plummeted, not to a dramatic angle, but to enough where it was noticeable. And once again, I, I chalked it up as, oh, John, you've read one too many books. This is silly pile on, you know, we're joking now, you know, boo, you know, we're pressing on further. Um, and I have this sudden temptation to reach into my pocket where, you know, um, coming from a Catholic background, I had a, a rosary with me, which I would always travel with. I, I pulled it out in a non-superstitious way, um, just to meditate on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I pull it out, and I basically just say a quick prayer to the good Lord, saying, you know, well, please help us out here. Please, you know, guide us, lead us, protect us. And... I want to emphasize to our listeners or viewers, depending on which platform you watch this, that you can hear the crickets up into this point. You could hear the underbrush. You could hear rustling among the trees. It was an ordinary evening. I pull out the rosary. I start saying, you know, you know, Jesus, please help us. I'm not yet pulling out, you know, Hail Mary full of grace or our Father who art in heaven or all the prayers from my background. I'm just saying the name of Jesus, okay? All the sound in the park or trail goes silent. All the crickets stop. You could hear our footfalls like thunder in your ears. And the feeling of being watched and being, dare I say, hunted increases. Now I found out something many years later something that I didn't know once again being the Yankee up here north um, who doesn't do any hunting um, apparently if there is a predator on the middle of the woods apparently if there is an animal hunting another animal or a person apparently the same phenomena happens where the sound of the underbrush stops and we get to a point where we reach um, a historical property coming up ahead and it's called Lyndhurst Mansion. Um, it is a real historical site. It was used by the Gould family and by one of the mayors of New York during the 20th century. Oh, and John, we've lost oh, your uh, camera. There we go. Just, we just, go. The, just the sign of low battery. Um, but yeah, it's a site used by the Gould family and it was used by one of the mayors of New York. Um, and it is a very real historical property 
that is it is pretty freaky looking i will say that from what i've been told and we get there and you know it seems like the pressure lightens up and you know man and i start cracking jokes you know we start you know um saying to ourselves ah oh, that was so stupid you know and i should emphasize before we get to the uh dimension like structure as we're walking on the left side of the trail this is also to 1 a.m in the morning it could, it could have been a uh, coincidence although I, I i personally don't believe it is um one of the insides of the buildings to our left seem to have a heavy thud or crack as though something was being dropped. So, you know, it could have been a branch, it could have been something, but I, I don't believe so. And I have, you know, it's very eerie. But anyway, we get to the mansion, we get to the, the main lawn that's in front of it. And as I said, we're, we're, we're cracking jokes now. We think, oh, the worst is past. And that horrible sense of dread just inexplicably increases, like, like exponentially. Um, I can attest to what I audibly heard. Um, Matt can attest to what he visually saw. Uh, what I audibly heard and what he audibly heard was from under the ground or what sounded from under the earth. Uh, what sounded like wailing or moaning in a male voice screaming or howling. And I have never heard that in the same way after. I've heard other things in the woods. Um, I've heard other things there as well, but nothing as loud or as crisp. Well, Matt uh, says to his dying day, um, at the time he was actually largely agnostic, leaning towards atheism, I might add. He saw what he believes to be blue light uh, hovering above an element of the tree line up ahead of him. And uh, we did uh, a lot less heroic deeds than good Rachel over here. Um, I could, have stood, I could have stood my ground, I could have said, in the name of Jesus be gone, but like cowards, us, we just, we ran. We ran hard. And we didn't stop running for quite a while, um, frankly, until basically we felt like the, the coast had utterly been cleared. Not that that would have prevented any spiritual activity, um, obviously, but from that, Journey back, I can't express to you the overwhelming sense that I had um, that we were being dogged or looked at until we got to that car. And when we got back, we, you know, I, I let us in a few of our fathers um, in a way that felt far more personal and relational in the name of Jesus than ever before. Uh, and it really, that event and two others, which I can tell on another occasion, got us really talking about the reality of evil spirits um, as defined by the Bible and the uh, experiences associated with it. So, and uh, from, I'd say Matt Lewis got saved formally um, in his own you know, private life. He wasn't very really talkative about it probably a couple of weeks after that. Uh, I had been saved already, uh, but I, I wasn't as formally in, in, in deep relationship with the Lord. And I have to say that oddly enough, that encounter did strengthen my desire to go back and understand the word of God better. Uh, uh, I became the basis of where I am right now, well, at least one of the basis for where I am at right now. So, so yeah. Yeah, that's an incredible story. And that's actually my first time hearing that story myself. So that's pretty crazy because we've known each other for years and we've talked about plenty of other experiences, but it's the first time I've heard that one. So very, very interesting and have a lot of takes on it, but we'll have to I'll probably yeah, say, save it for another for another time yeah. in, a, in a way um so i mean i guess that's going to be kind of be be it for now we're going to be making more and more videos and we're going to be telling more stories and again we want to hear your stories and uh, if possible we want to start getting people onto our channel to to be able to share their stories via zoom call um, or Skype, what, uh, however it ends up working out that we can best record. Obviously, we do not have professional equipment at the moment, but we really do appreciate you, you listening. Uh, please do the thing, uh, like and subscribe. Uh, one thing that is true about this channel and will remain true, uh, if I believe for as long as we have it, is this channel will never be monetized because the goal of this channel is not for us to make money uh, is to be able to share the word of God with you. 
It's been, it's to be able to help prepare you to fight against the evils of this world. And it's to be able to help you if you are experiencing um, demonic oppression to know that you're not alone and um, it's not just you. This has been Lions, Tigers, and Bears. Oh my. Right on. <laughs> jump, jump All right. Guys. We, leave us comments in the sections. We want to hear from you. Absolutely. All right. God bless. Y'all have a good day. God bless.